Hello, welcome, peace, salam, assalamu alaikum to our discussion of Horn of Africa TV. This is part two of my continuing discussion on the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, and beyond with my good friend and intellectual mentor, Professor Mohammed Hassan. I will not go into uh, a lengthy introduction. Uh, Suffice to say that Professor Mohammed Hassan is an astute political observer and analyst of the Horn of Africa. He's originally from Ethiopia, the Somali region, but he's multilingual, traveled over, all over the region, has written numerous articles and books. So with that introduction, uh, please uh, look uh, at the first part. It's in our YouTube channel. This is a continuation of that discussion. Now I'd like to welcome once again my good friend, Professor Mohammed Hassan. Welcome, Mohammed. Uh, thank you very much, Comrade Elias, uh, for inviting me second time. I hope we will have a fruitful discussion today. And I thank you very much for being with us. That is my hope indeed. Uh, from the feedback we are getting from part one of our discussion, uh, We've been getting many uh, positive feedbacks, some critical and some uh, uh, asking us uh, to elaborate on some points, which we will touch upon in this episode. But uh, today I would like to open the discussion with a poem, a poem that you're well familiar with. Uh, it's from the great Irish poet William Butler Yeats, W.B. Yeats, his famous poem, The Second Coming. It goes like this, uh, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loose, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. That is the first stanza of uh, that famous poem, The Second Coming. I feel that uh, this somehow uh, reflects on the situation in our region, uh, perhaps uh, the situation in Ethiopia. Um, the mood uh, does not seem to be that optimistic uh, in the general public. Am I reading too much into it? What, what do you feel? What is the zeitgeist, the feeling of, of the people, the public? Is there a sense that things are falling apart, that the center is not holding, that there, there is chaos and anarchy all over? Do you feel that or uh, do you feel the opposite? It's a very good question. Uh, the mood of the nation, as you have explained it, uh, a bit uh, not a bit, in fact, deeply divided. Uh, when Prime Minister Abiy came to power two years ago, the mood of the nation was very high. The prospects and the, the population hoped that a new start will begin. Uh, and he was very, very popular, not only in uh, Ethiopia, but also in the region. But the public misses also certain information because of 27 years under the tyranny of the TPLA. They wanted to breathe and uh, they hoped that there will be the end of the tunnel and light will be shining with the Prime Minister Abiy. But the contradictions which have remained in the country and accumulated for a very long time, it was there. It was covered by hope. Men was not digging deeper. Uh, uh, hope is for every nation is very important. It is a sort of a vitamin that which ignites a nation to regroup again and to start a new path. And that happened to a lot of nations who had been in a very serious crisis in the past. That is understandable. But reality is something else. Reality and, and facts are stubborn reality. They again slowly emerged again. And again, that it is the hope is 
I'm not say it is dashed, but the hope is decreased because of the contradictions and the sort of, of the contradictions in the, in the country. And uh, hope is always is a result of human beings, a result of a work, a result of thinking, uh, shedding light to the future. I think these three elements little bit now declining, and we can discuss further why, what are the reasons which uh, bringing the mood of the nation little bit down. Very good. Um, uh, what you're saying in a sense is that uh, between the expectations and the dreams and aspirations of the general population and the reality on the ground, there is a growing huge gap. And uh, you would uh, perhaps agree with me, uh, quoting the great uh, revolutionary intellectual Italian Antonio Gramsci, that in such times one must have pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. Would you agree with that uh, general statement? Indeed, indeed. It is a uh, of intellect is uh, uh, because of uh, contradictions are too deeper and it's very difficult to explain them. But optimism is always is, is uh, looking forward that nations can, can, can come back and be led, can walk properly in spite of all the difficulties they are facing to, toward uh, unity, toward the uh, uh, future. Otherwise, if there is no hope at all, then it is a society will disappear. There is no nations without hope. And I don't think we are in the process of disappearing, but we are in the process of difficult steps we have to take and we have to be prudent and wise that it is to say kata kata. And that needs a get from the politicians that to lead, there is no now, uh, uh, you know, if you go to the mosque on Friday, just to give an example, uh, Friday is an important day for Muslims in a way that it is the Imam will give a direction of the society. The Imam is not preaching something else, he's preaching the contradiction of the society, or also the priest in the parish will also discuss about the problem and the rumors in the society. At that moment, there was no television, there is no entertainment programs and so and so on. So the Imams and the priests, they are the journalists, they are also sometimes the post The organic intellectuals, uh, organic. to use another Gramscian term. Indeed, the peasant society. That it is, that's why sometimes they made a speech which brings hope to the, but now we need the politicians who sees from the dark, the light, and elaborate this very clearly to the population, unify the population, give the light, understand which road they are taking, and so on, instead of confusion. That is what I see that Ethiopia at this moment she needs politicians, far-sighted, who understand the minimum understanding of the population and give hope. That is missing in the country for the moment. Mm -hmm. With that, uh, I would like to bring you back or take you back to a period almost uh, 29 years ago, 1991, another transition in our region. There were, in fact, two transitions in, in our region at that time. One was in Addis Ababa and the other in Mogadishu. Maybe not at, the, at exactly the same moment, but more or less the same period of time. Uh, at that time, if you will remember, uh, in May of uh, 1991, uh, the United States was very much involved in the situation in Ethiopia. Uh, the Assistant Secretary of State then was a man uh, by the name of Herman Cohen. Many Ethiopians and Eritreans uh, are very familiar with the man. Uh, the Americans had previously, a few 
a week ago probably uh, arranged an exit strategy uh, for Mengistu Haile Mariam, the dictator in Ethiopia, an exit strategy whereby he, could, he would uh, be guaranteed an exile in Zimbabwe. And the term then used, uh, I remember uh, definitely, was a term soft landing or smooth transition to ensure smooth transition in Ethiopia after the collapse of the Derg. But uh, on the contrary, in Somalia, in Mogadishu, another regime was also collapsing, that of uh, Ziad Barre. Uh, but the Americans were never, uh, never seemed to be concerned about soft landing in Mogadishu or a smooth transition there, and Somalia was left to fend for itself, and uh, things fell apart, and the center could not hold, and uh, mere anarchy was loose upon that nation. That uh, a very unfortunate situation. What strikes me, though, is uh, Somalia was supposedly uh, an American ally, whereas Ethiopia at that time, under the Derg, was a client state of the Soviet Union, on the opposite camp. Why do you think uh, the United States was never concerned about uh, smooth transition and soft landing in Somalia? Why that the unfortunate uh, Somali nation had to suffer almost two decades and a half uh, of a chaotic, anarchic situation of warlords and took it a long time to, to, to recover? Why was that? Why a smooth transition was not... Uh, guaranteed in Somalia? It's a very good question. Uh, one needs to go back uh, uh, big, going back to the 1980s. Uh, the relationship between United States and uh, Somalia, it was a relationship built on the basis of the post When the popular uprise happened in Ethiopia, and then the military took over the power, the Cuban president visited Ethiopia in Mogadishu. I do remember that uh, President Castro of Cuba, he made his speech in Addis Ababa and made his speech also in Mogadishu. As a result of that, it is, the Ethiopian government and the Somali government was invited in Aden in southern Yemen. You're talking about uh, 1977 or 78, if I'm not mistaken? 77, 78, beginning. Yes. And before the war between Somalia and Ethiopia, the, the leadership, uh, uh, in fact, the Soviet leadership by 1977 were, uh, uh, when the first uh, delegation of Ethiopia, or the uh, uh, 1976, they visited Moscow, and uh, the Ethiopian delegation was uh, talking about uh, their contradiction with Somalia. The Soviet diplomacy was: there is a Somali delegation. If you want, we can arrange for you to to uh, face to face to meet. It surprised the Ethiopian delegation. It was led by uh, the Prime Minister Mikhail Muru at that moment who visited Moscow. And he was surprised that also the attitude of the Soviet at that moment was not friendly as uh, later on became friendly to Ethiopia. But as a result of all this, that there was a meeting in Eden where the Soviet Union uh, the, uh, and the East Germany, the Cubans, the South Yemenis, and uh, certain Eastern Europe Warsaw Pact uh, countries had participated, being the middle way, discussion between President Siad Bari and Mengistu Haile Mariam, and of course they put proposals there. Uh, in fact, if you look at the proposal, it is in favor of Somalia. Also. But as I have said, it was in the middle of uh, the post Cold War, and before that, since 1974, uh, there are uh, a secret organization of several states and their intelligence service 
have created called, it's called Safari Club, which was making a discussion how to remove the Soviet and the Kuman influence from the African continent. The, mm -hmm. Safari, the Safari Club is, is built or, or is an association, an informal association, which doesn't have any office, but it, it includes uh, King Hassan of Morocco, it includes the French intelligence service chief, it includes uh, William Colby of the CIA, it includes also the British intelligence, it includes also the Saudi intelligence, Turkey bin Faisal, and sometimes even King Fahd. It includes also the Savak uh, of Iran and Shah of Iran, and it includes- also Savak being the, the Iran. Iranian intelligence. Yes. It includes also sometimes the boss of South African intelligence, the apartheid intelligence, and Mobutu Sasoko, which they gave him at that time a big name that it is, they call him the Leopard of Africa, and this uh, and Sadat of Egypt. Their main purpose was to remove the influence of the Soviet Union and Cuba from the African continent. Anyway, I think they have succeeded. Uh, uh, when in Eden the discussion was uh, continued, so then finally they say you will meet after six weeks, you have to sign a document that there will not be a counter propaganda among uh, uh, two countries, Ethiopia and uh, uh, Somalia. This uh, the Somali region issue will be discussed again. We know that historically doesn't belong to Ethiopia, and the Ethiopians were very surprised. And then these people say, this is my first time, I have to go and discuss with my friends. And uh, finally, they led them to sign a common understanding, and they come back after six weeks. What happened is immediately after the Somali delegation arrived in Mogadishu, the next day is, for the first time, Kissinger visited Somalia. This is, Kissinger himself is part of the safari club. So apart from the genuine Somali issue or Ethiopian Somali issue, the cold you, war... You, uh, hold on a second there. You're saying that Henry Kissinger visited Mogadishu at that time? Yes, immediately after uh, the Somali delegation uh, uh, went back home, the next day Kissinger was there. I was not aware of that. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, he, he was there. And, and, and his main purpose is that to keep the contradiction and as it is, and the main purpose is to remove the Soviet and Cuban influence, because mm -hmm. it is uh, the Cuban influence also was very, very strong in Angola. Uh, they are supporting also SWAPO, they are supporting Angola. Of course, there is an alliance of the, uh, 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 of the states there, what they call the frontline states, Zimbabwe and Mozambique and all Pralimo uh, uh, united together with, 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 with uh, 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 anti-apartheid struggle, and this had frightened. And of course, uh, this frightened the U.S. interest and those French interests and all other interests in the region. And that's why they wanted the removal of the Soviet and Cuban troops from the African continent. So Henry Kissinger, he went there. I don't know what he have discussed, but in one of the documents I read, uh, Henry Kissinger, he was, uh, he made uh, uh, a minister of uh, mining and water resources in Washington, and he discussed with the minister. Uh, uh, a Somali minister. A Somali of... minister. He, what, uh, what, what was his name? Uh, uh, I, I may ask. His name. Uh, I, I forgot his name, but he's a, a, a young man. Uh, they met at Newark uh, with Kissinger, and Kissinger was complaining that Somalia was making a lot of noise in the different. Uh, forums against the United States and so and so on, and the minister was answering. But I can provide that document for people who wanted to read it. It is very interesting to understand what I am saying. In one side, we have a Cold War situation, uh, removing the Soviet and Cuban uh, This was more or less the same type of uh, concern as in Afghanistan, that, that the Brzezinski doctrine which would evolve later. Yes, the, what, they, what they call it, the African one, is that it is, they call it removing the carpet from the Soviet and Cuban leg. Yeah, so, whereas in Afghanistan, they would be creating the creating, Vietnam quagmire for the Soviet Union. Indeed, here is removing 
which is means encircling them and trying to remove them. And particularly after 1986, uh, uh, after the defeat of uh, the most important uh, 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 part of the uh, apartheid regime uh, in Angola, uh, 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 you know that UNITA also belongs to them. They are the ones who are subsidizing Savimbi. Uh, in this, uh, uh, we have to know now here also uh, in this project, China was involved with Savimbi was supported also by the People's Republic of China. So China considers also the Soviet Union is a social imperialist and so, and so on. We'll come later on in this word now. But what happened is that after that, uh, 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 of course, Somalia and Ethiopia, they went to war. Uh, by 1982, uh, for the first time, President Sherbari visited the United States. It was 1982, November. And uh, it was a huge delegation. The, it was in the time of uh, uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, they met, uh, they had their own discussion. And then after that, the Somali delegation, all of them, they were taken to Texas. Uh, the one who organized this meeting with uh, the two presidents, Somali president and uh, president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, it is an oil company, Conoco. Mm -hmm. Conoco, it is, it is based is in Texas. Mr. Hume, it's called, the, the owner is before Hume, who discovered the oil also in Libya in 1958, and he discovered mm -hmm. also the oil in Yemen. So Conoco, uh, uh, was the one who arranged it. At the same time, United States also gradually was building one of its biggest embassy in a sense that it have even helicopter landing and the possibility and so on in Mogadishu with a uh, hundred and something, hundred uh, and something million dollars they were building in Mogadishu, a new embassy. Huh? This is uh, for the public, publicly what you see. So mm -hmm. after 1982, uh, uh, the visit of uh, President Syed Barre to Washington and then to Texas, that it is uh, uh, Somalia have uh, allowed four companies, uh, Western companies, including um, Shell, to prospect for oil. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember I was, I was in Beidaba and uh, uh, somebody told me, uh, uh, are you going to Bardere? Bardere is a bit another small village outside of Beidaba, southern Somalia. When I, we arrived there, my wife, she was with me and her friend, her uh, girlfriend, and suddenly somebody who knows me, he said, yes, uh, uh, the people who look like your wife, they are, they are camping here. Uh, your wife being white. White. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, they are camping here, why don't you go in and and, and talk to them and they might give you cold drink or something like that. So when we went there, uh, they opened for us the door and we entered. All of them are Dutch engineers from Shell Company. Of course, they gave us a drink and talked to them. And one of them was, was a very nice guy. I liked him, an elderly man. He is a petroleum engineer. There were about 70 Dutch uh, Shell Company employees there. So finally, I made an appointment with him and we met uh, and I invited him uh, in the Chinese restaurant in Mogadishu. And I said, what you are doing? He said, what do you think? I'm not a soldier, I'm an engineer. We are looking for an oil. And I asked him, what is the prospect? He said, it's country, my dear. The deposit was very heavy. Huge deposits of oil in Somalia. In Somalia. So also other areas, about four com companies uh, came. So I think the discovery by itself it turned the situation very bad. That is my understanding and my research. The other How so? Uh, please explain. I think uh, 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 Kanoko, when he came to home and visited Mogadishu after that and had a very long discussion with President Syed Bari, they disagreed in how to share the wealth. And uh, Mr. Konoko, he said, if we don't sign this to the president, he will pay the price for it. He will not see the United Somalia. That's what he told him face to face. Uh, and, and I think uh, the fate of Somalia was decided 
apart from the internal contradiction by the oil companies. That is the decision was very clear. I will try to find the document and probably ask other people who have the document and the minutes and so on. He told him face to face, uh, uh, the owner of Conoco, that he said, you mm -hmm. decide our terms will be dictating. If you accept that, you can stay in power. If you don't accept, we'll remove you. You will not see you in Somalia. I think that is that meeting have decided the fate of Somalia. But apart mm -hmm. from that, there is also other imperialist forces in the region are also studying. What happened is that by 1985, that it is Gorbachev when he came to power. Mm -hmm. uh, when he, Gorbachev of the Soviet Union. Soviet Union. Then, he, then Soviet uh, Union. Yes, and, and he started his perestroika and openness and so on. The first letter he wrote, Gorbachev, was to the Italian and the French governments concerning Ethiopia. Uh, he says that we are fed up of Ethiopia. This man, whatever we provide him, that it, he loses his weapon to the rebels. And we don't see any prospect and we don't have any interest in that country. You are the previous colonial forces and who have interest in the region. We are withdrawing and we want to uh, do something about it. Uh, once this uh, letter was received by the French, at that moment, is uh, uh, President. France, he was a president of France. So was what, it Mitterrand was the president or? Yeah, yeah. 1985, Mitterrand was the president of France. What happened is that is immediately Mitterrand, uh, President Mitterrand uh, uh, directs this letter to the military and the military uh, uh, intelligence and, uh, and so on. He asked their uh, recommendation and to make studies. The person who knows Ethiopia and he made the studies, uh, he is alive, uh, he is an uh, uh, Ethiopia specialist, uh, Mr. René Lafour. He is the one who made the study. He made the study in 1985 and he said that in his studies, I read the study, I got it from a comrade uh, and I even presented it to the Somali government at that moment. It says that it is by hook or crook, Eritrea will get independence. And he made it very clearly. Uh, it is not bad one time to invite uh, Professor Radole Court to ask him um, to hear from his own mouth. He is the one who wrote uh, that memorandum to the French government. Now, mm. He's still very, very active writing about Ethiopia. And, yes, uh, he, he is the only specialist on Ethiopia. In the time of the revolution, also he wrote a book uh, uh, on Ethiopia revolution. He knows in and out of Ethiopia. He understands the psychology of Ethiopian people and so and so on. So it is not bad now to engage him uh, in discussion about this document he wrote himself and mm -hmm. uh, what was the reaction of the French uh, uh, and how they dealt with that document. To come uh, 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 until 1990, in the process, after the French released this, uh, uh, a lot of acrobats from the U.S. side came. Uh, after a while, that came to coup in Addis Ababa, uh, the failure of that coup, uh, the military defeat, uh, regular... Talking about the coup by uh, the generals in 1989, the attempted coup against Mengistu. Yes, and uh, of course, Militarily also losing in the different fields inside Eritrea, and uh, his power was shrinking. The economic situation also was getting very bad. The famine, which came also in 1984, uh, after that, of course, he was also inaugurating his uh, uh, workers' party, which damaged the, the image of the country. The defection of the Dawids and so on. To, and Goshi Dawit Walde Georgis, Colonel Goshi Walde, and so on and so forth. Yes, yes, by pouring at that moment for the famine and defection to the other side. All this also weakened uh, uh, Mengistu's regime, uh, the defeat uh, at the airport of Asmara, and so on, the commandos entering there, then the upper to the all and all, all this. So it was very clear that also uh, uh, Mengistu's regime was not as stable as, 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 as people so, are thinking. 
So the both to, to use uh, Mark Aki's term, the die was cast for Mengistu at that time. Indeed. Mengistu uh, regime, it is the die was casted in 1982 after the Red Star War. After the Red Star War... Uh, uh, against the EPLF. Against the EPLF. That, is, if he had been a very wise, uh, calculative leadership leader, he could have understood that it is, yes, he had all the equipment, he will, had a very good support of, uh, of, of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and so on. Uh, he thought that he will defeat uh, the EPLF and the rebel, very as he calls it, rebel, and succeed. And uh, 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 if a wise conclusion could be made from that, uh, as you read that Baal Ugerma in his, in his book, which is called uh, Oromai, he made it very clear. When you read it very clear, the die was casted for the regime by 1982. But still, it had a support to a certain extent, external support and so on. I was talking by that moment. Uh, I met uh, 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 the party school, Cuban party school director general who passed away. And he was uh, uh, a commissar of, uh, of the, a commissar of the Cuban army with General Achawa in Addis Ababa. He came to visit our party here for the May Day. And by accident, he was stationed or he was lodged uh, in uh, a comrade uh, house, which is not very far from my place where I live, because I live in number 40 and he lives in number 41. While they were discussing, and, and when he told him that he had been in Ethiopia, he said, there is an Ethiopian who's living here. And then immediately he said, please, can you invite him? I would like to see him. And I met him, a very lovely, a highly educated person. He's the director of the political school and so on. And then he met me and he said, uh, he was reading also sometimes my article in the Etude Marxist, and we discussed about Ethiopia. He told me that it is, he is one of the dele, dele, uh, delegation member when Mengistu asked them to travel to Eritrea before 1982 Red Star uh, uh, War, which Mengistu uh, unleashed uh, against the EPLF, he said, I am one of them. And me, a Soviet general and, and a South Yemeni general, uh, we traveled together to visit Eritrea. And of course, the country is full of mountains. And uh, we traveled and we saw, and then I sent it to Castro to Fidel, he calls him Fidel, and he said, uh, I sent him, I said, no, no, this is, you cannot solve it militarily. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. You can only solve in politi politically. And I sent uh, to uh, Castro, I said, this is impossible, this war cannot be won. Uh, uh, if you remove them from one mountain, the rebels, they can enter to another mountain, you need to have millions of millions of soldiers, and that is not a guarantee. And he said, from that on, we refuse to intervene in this return situation. That's what from his mouth I heard. So uh, we discussed longer than not, than not a lot of uh, issues. But mm -hmm. to come to our point, uh, uh, why United States attitude? Uh, uh, United States also, I think, uh, uh, after the French studies, uh, I met President. Uh, Siad Bari, uh, before he is going with European uh, parliamentarians in Mogadishu, before the meeting between him and Mengistu, the first meeting in the name of IGAD. IGAD was established at that moment to combat famine and drought. And for the first time uh, under uh, uh, Gouled, the president, the late president, uh, Hassan Gouled of Djibouti, which brought the two leadership to discuss face to face. Uh, uh, while they were discussing is that it is uh, the commandos have entered into Asmara Airport and destroyed the, the fleet which is uh, standing there, and Mangistu have interrupted the discussion and left. The purpose of IGAT was first to bring to, to these leaders, but once after the, this commandos operation at the airport and the defeat of Ethiopian Air Force, a uh, big part of the Ethiopian Air Force plane was being. Uh, destroyed uh, there, then it is the West losing hope in general 
the, uh, they didn't have a very clear understanding what is going to happen in the Horn of Africa. Of course, they were very busy in Poland, they were very busy in Afghanistan and so on. It is as a side politics, sideline politics, they were dealing on the Horn of Africa. And there was no as such specialist appeared at that moment to study the problems and the contradiction in general. But now and then there is some intelligent officers and so on uh, claim. But as I have said that it is Mr. Hume's decision, Konoko's decision on Somalia, it became decisive in the foreign policy of the United States. And once the difference when you see the collapse of the Siad Baris regime and the collapse of Mangistu's regime, there is only five months of difference. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that is, in, in the first of January, it is, it is the President Siad Baris left the palace and, 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 and he fled away to the rural areas. And on May, also Mangistu ran away and he went to Zimbabwe. The difference was only five months. The gap is very small. Uh, uh, but they just dropped it as it is, and they were concentrating on Ethiopia. For a lot of reasons, they were concentrating on Ethiopia now. Uh, the main reason is uh, leave Somalia to be in a such situation. It will control by itself, because that Ethiopia, the moment she gets stabilized, we will turn back about uh, about Somalia. That is probably one of their vision. Second, there may be, it will weaken also gradually the Somali nationalism, pan-Somalism, which start weakening from 1982 and so on, the development mm -hmm. of clan warlords and so, and so on. Ah, this is by itself, it is a mechanism that will control the Somali situation and it will not endanger the peace and the stability in the future we are envisaging in Ethiopia. The second point is very important which affected the Horn of Africa is that it is the, the collapse of the Soviet Union by 89 and the change in the world situation. That United States felt they are the winner, NATO feels that they are the winner, and a lot of theoreticians appeared at that moment, which is- Like Francis Fukuyama, the end of history and all that. Very good. Uh, uh, one have to read, for example, in order to understand, Francis Fukuyama visited Ethiopia in 1992. He was brought as an expert, as a professor uh, 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 to Ethiopia by USAID to write country program. We will publish also that document. This is the man who stayed only for 72 hours drinking his whiskey at the Hilton Hotel, and he just wrote a complete country plan for Ethiopia. When you read the country plan of it, it was a carbon copy what Malle Zanaya applied in Ethiopia. In mm -hmm. fact, the one who really led Ethiopia, you could say, and ideologically, economically, and politically, is Francis Fukuyama. That is, mm -hmm. he wrote for the country plan, he gave it to Malle, and when you read every step that Mele Zenawi and TPLF did, it is that document was applied in Ethiopia. There is no, there is no document from TPLF which came. We leave that the primitive thinking of them aside. It was Francis Fukuyama's direction was applied in Ethiopia, and we will provide you this document uh, as soon as possible in our website. To come is that it is. It is, uh, uh, he wrote the country program, but uh, we will discuss later on about that. They have left Somalia to control, and they call it a natural control. It controls itself. So the danger mm -hmm. is no more there. So we can mm -hmm. focus now on, 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 on rebuilding another uh, Ethiopia or another Horn of Africa in the way they understand it. They had won the Cold War, as they call it, uh, a lot of ideologues came, uh, they wrote about mm. it, at the end of history, whatever it is, and so on. Yeah, now uh, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, his shock therapy, and Samuel Huntington, these all also were enamored uh, or uh, supportive of Melles Denawi as the enlightened leader, the neoliberal uh, 
Indeed. And uh, uh, of course, uh, it's the only one who disagreed with them who says, yes, it is, it's true that there is an uh, uh, end of uh, history, there is, uh, and then his book of Clash of Civilization and so on. It is Brzezinski who wrote the Great Chess Board, and he says that we have to control Euro Asia. If we control Euro Asia, we control the world, we can control Africa, we can control Latin America, and so and so on. Uh, uh, all of them have died now, these people, but their books is available. Anyway, to come to uh, Ethiopia, they consider uh, there is two theoretical documents have been developed at that moment. I have told you that, that the think tank leaders, these professors, what they wrote. The second is the Pentagon. The Pentagon developed its own view. Now, it's after the Cold War how it will manage the world. And the Pentagon, it considers at that moment. The, the US uh, Defense Department. Defense uh, Department published a document, DOD, Defense Department, Africa, yes, interest. So they divided Africa in different parts. They divided that it is Egypt and in Mauritania, that it is one part of Africa. The northern part of Africa. Northern part of Africa, the eastern Africa or Horn of Africa, bigger Horn of Africa, uh, it is another one part. Then southern Africa, South Africa and the southern region, and West Africa, the big West Africa, and Nigeria. And so on. Once they published that, the, uh, the you're talking about the the four anchors theory of control in Africa. On, later on, from that, from the document of those of Defense Department, that it is uh, uh, politically translated by Anthony Lay, and he developed his idea of anchor state on the basis of that. For Greater Horn of Africa, Ethiopia was nominated. For West Africa, Nigeria was nominated. For Southern Africa, Mbeke of South Africa was nominated. For Northern Africa, is Egypt, Mubarak was nominated. Saying that instead of dealing with all these states, it's better to deal with these four anchor states and delegate them that they can, through them, in our behalf, they can implement our policies in the regions. And Ethiopia mm -hmm. was nominated also from that point of view. So from that perspective, we could, one also have to see that it is TPLF arrogance and contradictions. Later on, they created against Eritrea because Eritrea was seen is a totally different policy in economic and, 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 and social and politics, which is totally independent from their greater umbrella of domination of neocolonial Africa and uh, with the US uh, project. So Eritrea was not liked, and they saw it that it is an, uh, as a rotten apple uh, within a box to so Eritrea and the, the government in Eritrea, the, the ideology, the nation building, self reliance. All this was not like what Chomsky in his book he writes, and I advise any Ethiopian and anybody from the Horn of Africa to read his Managua paper. It is a book called uh, Power and Ideology. He clearly uh, explains the State Department policy from 1947 until now, wh why such kind of countries are considered, despite they can be even small, considered more dangerous than very big countries who have huge resources as Brazil, which they have it in their pocket. So I advise that young people to read this book, Power and Ideology, to give them that I see the conflict against Eritrea is from an ideological point of view. And from the view of Eritrea, how it looks uh, to the world, uh, self-reliance. Mm -hmm. Self-reliance is a very bad term from this uh, perspective means that it's self-reliance against whom we use our resources, we will build our population, national independence, that it is the Sawa establishment 1994. All this situation, it gave that it is TPLF is a mercenary organization. They can use TPLF as a mercenary to intervene and to wage war and destabilize nations like Eritrea or send them in an areas like in, uh, in Somalia, which we have seen. So finally, Ethiopia became 
the trusted client state of the Greater Horn of Africa. Greater Horn of Africa. That is it. Okay, I, uh, it's a good elaboration of, uh, we went back to 30 years. So while we are there, uh, almost uh, 28 years ago in 1992, uh, there was a, a transition after the collapse of the Mengistu regime, the so Eritrea becoming uh, de facto independent and uh, the TPLF uh, entering Addis Ababa and becoming uh, the ruling uh, regime. There was a transitional stage, albeit uh, very brief. Since you talked in the first part of our discussion about your idea of transition now, uh, that the transition has to be a longer period, you, I believe you mentioned 10 years. Uh, but at that time, the transition was not that long. It was, in fact, very, very hurried. Uh, it was pushed by, by the TPLF's agenda. And of course, uh, a, a sort of ch a charter was drawn up with the collaboration, cooperation of the Oromo Liberation Front. But after that, the Oromo Liberation Front was also crushed and kicked out. Uh, what went wrong? Why, what was the problem then? Uh, why did the TPLF uh, rush the, the transition into, and kicked out the, the OLF from the transitional government? It's, We're uh, talking about 1992, 20 years, 28 years from now ago. My understanding at that moment and now, uh, all the actors who came to the transitional government, they were not ready to have no, a clear program what to do with it. Now, when I'm looking back after 28 years, First of all, the TPLF was never being prepared to rule that country. TPLF by itself is a very confused organization. It jumped from one place to another place. From independence of Tigray with the manifesto, then it turned that to self-determination. Then in the process when the struggle was going on and the center was weakening, and once they have liberated the whole Tigray, big part of their combatants, they say, well, you were telling us that there is also oppressed on the other side. So let them, the other oppressed, to continue their, uh, their share of the struggle. They refused even to, 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 to leave after Tigray. They say, we have liberated Tigray. It took them months to convince even their combatants. Some of them, even by, by referendum, they say, no, we'll go back to our villages and they just went back. So nobody, TPLF didn't have what will happen. Suppose the military regime collapse, what they are going to do? I don't think they have a blueprint and so on. So they were just going with the wave. But in the process, of course, they prepared the EPRDF. I mean, the EPRDF is a cover of TPLF by creating an Oromo organization and, and by creating uh, also, there was a small EPRP which later on became Amhara organization, and so on and so on. They came. Their military capacity is much bigger than the oil. But what kind of country they want? Both of them, it was not the oil. It was very clear, Oromia, and they wanted a federal state. That is the clear side of it. But beyond that, how they can they will apply? They have no strategy, they didn't have uh, the patience, they didn't also, also the change for them came very fast. I mean, without being very strong militarily and so on, a change came. So uh, the transition, uh, it has two meanings for both organizations. Uh, the ONLF also was there, the political, it has two meanings. For TPLF, it is, a transition of consolidation of power. That was the strategy of TPLF. 
once they enter in, in the name of EPRD, they have to consolidate their power gradually, slowly, and implant their own protege organization in Oromia and slowly create also for Southern people and so and so. So they were working from a village level up, try to confuse the people and consolidate the power in the center. That they have uh, destroyed the army, they destroyed everything, and they are the one who are well organized military and, and, and military organization. For the OLF is the most important post to have an Oromia and also to have a region, what Oromo speaking region, and implement also the Oromo alphabet, which is called the Ibe, and that Oromo stand for the first time who had been living in the different provinces brought together, and they will live in one umbrella called Oromia, uh, which they succeeded on that by having that. But after that, how to share the power? What kind of Ethiopia we want? And so on, it was not discussed. Because this needs a lot of discussions. To have a transitional government based on national reconciliation, you don't isolate one group. You must allow everybody. EPRDF, when it was created, even they said in their document at that moment, element of the DERG also can participate as political organization in the transitional government. But that it was for propaganda reasons. It was not seriously, they were thinking on that term. So the transition was a very limited, small group of political forces. Most of them are very weak or non-existence later on was created after the defeat of the Derg. In normal circumstance, in a country like Ethiopia, multinational, it have a lot of historical uh, contradiction. It have a lot of other contradiction as any other country, but it's plus of it, it is an empire, it have nationalities problems. It have also other problems and so and so on. You could have enlarged uh, uh, the participation of all the political forces to participate in this transition and discuss in a longer uh, period and they knew each other, introduce each other and so and so on. That didn't happen. So the pregnancy was aborted very quick for TPLF and wanted to consolidate the power as soon as possible. So for TPLF, mm -hmm. the transition is not a transition, is a process of consolidation and domination of power. At that process, they have to eliminate all other forces who are against them. In that way, they took over and dominated. The second is, of, of course, from the interest of the outside external forces, they wanted to see one center. One center led with one organization. They didn't care whether it is democracy in Ethiopia or not. They didn't care. The, the, the vision they have, anyway, this is an empire. We don't care who is ruling them, but we need one center which is solid, militarily strong, and we will shower them from above and we control the region. And from here, as we have applied with our philosophy and our strategy, then we will make it also an anchor and it will be a stepping stone for us as before for intervention everywhere in the continent. And of course, plus combating the idea of Eritrea, which is implementing a self-reliance. Therefore, there was no transition in that sense. It's a fake transition, and it is not based also on the balance of forces. The only force in the country was TPL, which had the army, which became also national army, then gradually organized the country in the way they wanted it. So how to see that, how it was implemented, what happened is that intellectuals who used to live in the United States probably had also a link with the US administration. This they were brought in into, some of them uh, have linked mm -hmm. brought into the country. While the transition was going on, immediately the TPLF created the Constitution, the Constitution Committee, uh, Commission. And this Constitution Commission is a selected individuals, huh? were brought from outside and from inside, like uh, the former President Nagaso Gidada and people I know or others, they were brought in. And it was led by... Uh, uh, people like uh, Kifle Wodajo, I suppose. And so, and so on, they were brought there. So while transition was continuing, which is uh, uh, that this commission was working, working and drafting the constitution. So this, there was no debate on the constitution also. Once it was finished, it was brought in, and then they made a constitutional assembly, 
and finally that which is uh, they say it is uh, accepted by the people and then they went into the election in 1995 but if it, there was been a longer if you want really a reconciliation in a sense of a country and really you want the country to be stable and have an, an, a good relationship the young people to know each other the debate became very frank and honest and uh, democratic the, contradi the historical contradiction brought up in the table. All the difficulties the nation was, was facing, it had, that needs a genuine patriotic democratic sentiment. That TPLF didn't have. It had an ethnic background ideology. It doesn't have a vision for the thing. And secondly, they are willing to sleep with anybody in the bed because for them, as long as that TPLF is the dominant political power in Ethiopia, they can also give service for anybody who is asking them in the region, and they put themselves in that it is the Haile Selassie's regime was pro, uh, pro United States, and we are pro United States, and we will be the anchor in the region. So they didn't mm -hmm. resolve it, and then they declared their own their own constitution, and then they made election. They came to power. Now to come uh, after 28 years and the collapse of the TPLF and chased away by, by, by uh, the uprise of Ethiopian people, specific to Oromo and Amara, Oromo Alliance and so on, it created a new situation. Here we have to be very, very careful and we have to understand what happened. We, we will come to that, uh, but before uh, we, we leave the 92 transition, uh, I would also like to bring uh, to, to, to the discussion the recommendation of one uh, former intelligence official, U.S. Uh, American intelligence officer by the name of Paul Henze, who recommended at that time uh, to Merlis Zenawi, then uh, president, I suppose, of uh, Ethiopia, uh, about how he should handle the Oromo uh, situation and the OLF. Can you briefly talk about that letter and uh, what was he, uh, wh why, why was he focusing? Was that uh, the recommendation that pushed Melas Zenawi and the TPLF to finally crush uh, by force the OLF and expel them out of the transition? It's a very good question. Uh, we will also probably publish uh, this document of Paul Hens, his advice to Mellas uh, uh, in his writing that uh, after uh, coming back from Central Asia, uh, taking American business people to Central Asia. That's what he says in his document. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for Paul Hens, he needed a center. Who was Paul Henze, by the way, for Paul, for Paul, Henze, Paul Henze is a, uh, a former CIA intelligence officer, worked also as a publisher in RAND Cooperation, is a think tank which is subsidized by, by the intelligence and U.S. government. And Paul Henze also, he had been advisor for the military regime in uh, 1980 after they took the power uh, in Turkey, in a coup. Mm -hmm. uh, is known and, and the most hated person in Turkey. Every mother, she can tell you who is Paul Hans when you come to Turkey. And Turkey, there was a, at that moment, the left and the military, they were in a very serious clashes. And there was a lot of uh, 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 killing happened by the military junta against the revolutionary elements in Turkey. And he was the advisor of the military. The right-wing fascistic, uh, fascistic elements. Fascistic yeah, yeah. Elements uh, uh, Noam Chomsky also does mention him in, uh, in his book with uh, Edward Herrmann, uh, the manufacturing consent. Indeed. indeed. The, the assassination attempt on the Pope, uh, Aga, or whatever, the yeah. Turkish. Indeed. It's supporting what they call the, the Grey Wolf. The, yeah, the Grey Wolves, uh, yes. the, fascist, the fascist, uh, fascist gang of yes. Turkey. Yes, and he was uh, framing them in ideology and so on. But later on, he became also an advisor for Melle Zenawi 
because windmill is in our we, after the Rome conference in 1989, when they met the Dirk and the- uh, 1990, rather. Yes, 1990, 19. he published it. And when they went to United States, they met uh, Paul Hens, uh, uh, because Merlis insisted he wanted to see Paul Hens. And they had a very long discussions. And uh, of course, uh, Paul Hens at that moment, he, at that particular time when well, hence published that document, his discussion with Mala Zainawi, was not very good friend of Mala Zainawi. He published it, all the document as a row. After that, they became closer and so on. So on. Uh, Paul Hens is also is, uh, a think tank for the TPLF regime. When I was in Washington, are two individuals who are really important for the TPLF regime. Uh, in the U.S. establishment. You, you were in Washington, Washington as a diplomat at the Ethiopian Washington, embassy then? Ethiopian embassy, 1994. Okay. It was uh, uh, very important when there is a, uh, even when they make a press conference or when they invite these two uh, Americans, uh, uh, these two white people, they have to be invited and they sit in the front line as a, as a curtain of uh, of uh, TPLF regime. One is Paul Hens, another one, uh, Ottawa, the woman who once. Oh, Marina Ottawa, yeah. Marina, Marina Ottawa, which she published uh, a book. Uh, I believe she, she worked at the Brookings and her husband, yeah. David Ottawa, yeah. Yes. So it is, in, in a way, is that it is these two are the vanguard of uh, and the lobbyist uh, 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 of Melazina. The third is. Uh, important in the second level, their lobbyist is, is a former U.S. ambassador who had been ambassador uh, uh, in, in, in Somalia. Uh, later on became, uh, his son uh, was a businessman uh, and I think he had some business deal with Ethiopia, uh, Robert Oakley. Uh, these, okay, are yes. Oakley. these are the elements they were supporting the TPLF. So the document of uh, Paul Hens when he's writing to Malaysia now concerning uh, uh, the oil left, he says that the oil left are making a lot of noise and trying to influence some Congress pain and telling them lies and so and so on. And he recommend five or six recommendations to Malaysia now to reduce the oil left in Oromia into ungovernable uh, teeny, governable teeny states and so on. Don't listen to them. These are not good. For, uh, they are not good for nothing and so, and so on. And then he recommends that. We will publish that. It's very important to read this document on one side and to read also Samuel Huntington in economic science. Of it. These two are the main advisors of Mele Zenawi, which majority of the people speak and understand and nobody explained to them until today. Mm -hmm. This is the situation. The problem is that the level of the discussion in Ethiopia also, it went very, very low. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and the intellectual level, uh, uh, as if Ethiopia is isolated and living in Mars, and the whole world is living on the Earth. So it is, you are talking to a country which is uh, outside of the globe, and it is in another universe. The uh, whole media, the whole intellectual class, it reaches to the level that it is impossible to understand them because they don't understand the war, they don't understand their country, and they don't understand themselves. So the crisis which we started in the beginning, that it is the crisis of hope, the crisis of vision, it comes because of all these 28 years of, of TPLF ruling that country through ignorance, mm -hmm. and that the is low level of consciousness overall in the in the political discourse, the intellectual discourse, in the very low level of uh, uh, consciousness, because it turned it into uh, biological consciousness rather than into there is no politics in that country, and uh, politics is a modern thing to analyze and so on. It became more about who I am and what you are and so on and so on. There is no social analysis. There is no class analysis. There is nothing. Mm -hmm. That's why a excessive uh, focus on identity politics, on uh, extremely, ethnicity, yes. religion. Indeed. Extremely, 
it is like uh, opium it became uh, it is a uh, uh, this identity thing it became an opium like uh, throwing sand on the eyes of the population and instead of discussing also other major concern and which is concerns the life of the people the majority of the mm. population are very poor would you agree uh, that uh, class is very much absent in the discussion in present day Ethiopia? There is no class. As if Ethiopia is living in other planet. Like a classless society. Or... Classless society, but it is an ethnic society. It is more over ethnic rather than a thing. And every every group or elite of every group is, is, is an elite of its own ethnic, whether it is in the name of unity or disunity, but it is the same dispute. There is no no, a political class who really analyzes and try to bring a new nation and new basis and so on and bring the unity and so on. If you take those who call unity, you ask them unity in what sense, they cannot explain to you. They will just tell you that unity because we lived the 3000 years and so on, so on which is a, a very, very, very uh, difficult to, uh, to understand. And, mm-hmm. the, and the other side is that more self-determination and this and so on and so on, but in concrete self-determination for whom, how, from whom and so on is not clear, is not understandable. So the youth, the majority youth who is unemployed, marginalized, the women, the workers, the all social classes in the country frustrated and dormant. And that is the dangerous side of it because in such a situation, very, very dangerous because it is anybody can explore the grievances, the socio-economic grievances of the people and divert it to whatever channel it wants. And for this is very dangerous. And, and it happened in other countries that it is the same like Rwanda or Burundi, which you see this uh, uh, who, who see problem. That when you go to Rwanda or Burundi, then you don't see the difference between who to and to see. All of them, they speak the same language. All of them, they are Catholic, I think they thought, except the minority Muslims, which is now increasing in Rwanda and so on. But the whole discussion is, is on the basis of Hutu and Tutsi. There is no discussion of a class analysis. Nobody analyzed the class analysis of Rwanda under the, uh, the, the, the MRND of Havre Hamanas regime, or before that, and so on. So the division, the class division, the peasant problem, the landless peasant, and so on, mm-hmm. and this and this. So they have to kind how, of... And how the Belgian colonialists, colonialists exacerbated... Uh... Exactly, yes. And yeah. in Ethiopia also, there is no an objective. And of course, there is a denial now also, denial of the student movement, huh? as if it is left. Left is very bad, uh, and, so, and so on. That is, in fact, it is the classless society. We are discussing as Ethiopians. We don't speak about class. We don't speak about the social classes in the society who had benefited. When you define, you say this is this type of regime, whom it represents, and so on. No explanation. Classless society added to its democracy, which no nation in the world have reached to that. But Ethiopia is the only one who is uh, swimming in this. Uh, uh, poverty of philosophy and uh, delusional type of thinking. That is it. That I think. So uh, let us now discuss. Uh, you touched upon it last time in our uh, conversation in the first part. The need for uh, an extended, broad, and open national dialogue, uh, where uh, intellectuals would take the lead, but uh, civil society. Uh, representatives of all religions, if need be, Christians, Muslims, and traditional religions, all national ethnic backgrounds, uh, gender representation, professionals, trade unions, and what have you. This kind of, your view, your vision of a broad national dialogue was along that line. And you you said that that is absent and that that is uh, not good for the transition, and I agree with that. But uh, Professor Mohammed, there is also uh, something which may pass for that. Uh, there's a, a dialogue uh, of source by the political parties, which we, uh, which has created a lot of uh, brouhaha in the past uh, past week after our first part conversation. 
the paper presented there by Professor Merera Gudina of the Oromo Federalist Congress and his vision, uh, how he saw the, the political history of modern Ethiopia from Menelik up to Dr. Avi and what needs to be done is 10 point in the conclusion. Uh, uh, I, I thought there was, was uh, non-controversial uh, that uh, there was a point of view that needed to be discussed but there seemed to be a lot of uh, backlash against it. Uh, so my question to you is, first of all, what, what is this uh, dialogue of political parties? Could that be considered as the beginning of a national dialogue or uh, of what you had envisioned or talked about in the first part? Or is this fruitful? Uh, and talk, if you will, also about uh, Professor Merara Gudina's uh, paper, controversial paper. It's a very good question. First of all, when I'm speaking about uh, national dialogue uh, and creating a sort of uh, long dialogue among the different forces of Ethiopians from different parts of the country, that is, uh, first of all, must be understood by the Prime Minister himself. In a normal situation, if you really want to build a new relationship among the Ethiopian peoples in general, and to clarify the differences of among the different social classes in the country, if the Prime Minister leads this, and becomes open. I am a transitional prime minister. I will open the Pandora box. I will let everybody to sit and to discuss for a very long time. No taboos in any issue. Not necessarily they have to agree with me or to, or to disagree. The judge will be the Ethiopian people themselves. We will even create and an ombudsman which will communicate with the masses of Ethiopia that it is mothers, uh, housewives, women associations, workers association and so on can write to the ombudsman to participate in the debate. The debate will be not only horizontal but also vertical that the population can participate and say all their frustrations because they, they don't know each other. This They live in one geography, but they don't understand each other. They don't know their own history. They are not, who knows about the history of Yayem? Who knows the history of the Mursi? Who knows the history of uh, Walaita? Who knows the history of Hadiyya? Or whatever it is. There is a glimpse of information roaming around. Letting in one side politicians and so on, all the population debating, on the other side, also the population can see who have the wisdom, who are really serious people who are talking for the future. We speak of the past in order to understand of today, but we have to have also from today, what kind of a future in the Horn of Africa Ethiopians want? How can our relationship will be with other people of Horn of Africa? And so on. A very vast independent thinking that the Prime Minister could have played that role, allowing Ethiopians to play the football on the ground. Bring them, and gradually that it might sink certain ideas, and they might even come, they are human beings, they might, that first of all, their fate, it is distant to live together, to cooperate together, economically, socially, psychologically, and so on. If they don't, it is then if they fail, State. Second, this, the right of nationality, it's a very dangerous weapon. If you don't handle it correctly and scientifically, it can turn into a very dangerous weapon which will bring a very serious civil war among the population. It creates a grudge, a deep grudge among the population. Politicians who want to rule that country if they want to rule only for 10 years, five years, that is that's something else, then, then it is 
a gang who wants to rule and loot and live. But if you wanted to be in history and you wanted to put your print in the history of that nation, a very big nation, added to it also, you have a vision of the whole region of the Horn of Africa. You have to be first yourself democrat, very open, and so on and so on. The prime minister must do several steps. If I will be him, I will do that. First, as an Oromo, there is an Oromo question for the last 50 years. There are different Oromo organizations. They might be even different from his opinion. He is also a chairman of an Oromo organization. Have a dialogue, a discussion. All Oromos of all types, Oromos have 2,800 clans. Oromos have four religions. Oromos have different social economies and so on. Let Oromos discuss about themselves, introduce themselves, not somebody else tell, to tell them what they are. They have to tell us what they are, what they feel, what they discuss among themselves. And they have to come with a minimum program, what kind of a country Ethiopia they want and how they wanted to live with all the other Ethiopian people. The discussion must be very open and democratic and should be led by him. That is one, because he himself is an Oromo. He says that it is, his constituency is Oromia. He is leading an uh, Oromo political party, which has now become part of Belsadinna. That is very, very important. I think uh, to continue the dialogue, he had started in a good start, and it have reached in a very nice place, and then from there he was blocked down. One, when he and Lamma's team, they followed their trip. When Lamma says, it will probably not so slow. Huh? That it is in a way of an answer to men, to men, Oromo Ethiopians. Yes, we are also Ethiopians. Please don't suspect us that we have other agenda. We don't have other agenda. It is, uh, and so on. Then they went further. It was the best time for them, for both of them, the prime minister and Lamma and so on and so on when they transformed the OPDO into Oromo Democratic Organization. I would really like all Ethiopians who are listening to me and people of Horn of Africa to see that conference, the Jimma conference, when OPDO transformed itself from OPDO to Oromo Democratic. I made an interview with Betty. I told her, ask them why yesterday they were uh, OPDO and why they are now Oromo Democratic. Oromo Democratic, it came from a simple, genuine understanding. The OPDO, for a big part of it, it was not accepted by Oromo people. Mm -hmm. they said it is a protege, is an instrument of the TPLA. Within the, the OPDO, people also wanted to transform the OPDO, to change it into Oromo Democratic. That was a very good step to bring all Oromos and to have a discussion, probably if they have enlarged it. And they had discussion once they transformed the party into Oromo Democratic Party. Probably, and the discussion continues very genuinely. I'm sure Johar and others and so on could have joined. All the active, active, activist Oromos, which I knew for the last four years, they were very active. They are speaking the same thing what the prime minister was saying at that moment, what Lemma was saying at, this, at that moment. They could have joined the party. The party could have another characteristics. Here I would like to explain one thing. Yes, OPDO was created by TPLA. Yes, Congress Party was created by the British colonial ministry. Congress Party of India, you're talking of about. India, yes. You can create as an oppressor, an organization, a tool to confuse the masses which you rule. But you cannot confuse the masses for a very long time. At one time, the masses can be very aware. But the Congress party was, was created when in the time in 1870, the time the, almost on the eve of the second biggest Indian people revolt after the famine happened in India and so on. The person who have suggested, a very wise young man who finished from Cambridge University, he toured the whole India and he says, oh, oh we will lose India. If we lose India, British domination in Europe will disappear and Germany will be the strongest. That is the moment when Germany was unified by Bismarck and it even defeated France and it took 
two provinces from France, Alsace and Lorraine. A very far-sighted colonial thinker. Then he said, we have to rule India jointly with Indian aristocracy and bourgeoisie, the Tatas and the Berlas and all this, and the aristocracy and us. We rule it together jointly. That for that, we have to create the Congress party. Okay, TPLF created OPDO. OPDO as the president of Oromia. In the last speech, which is, they say, uh, the lift speech, he said, 1990, 1989, we have changed it. Uh, uh, 19, uh, uh, 19, uh, 98, well, I don't know. Uh, he says that it is the reformist came, which he considers that the Lama Magarsas and so, and so on. We will change Oromia and slowly we will be independent party. So with that Jima conference, they could have enlarged that, integrated the best element, the young generation. The young generation, when you take the, the Garasu Tufas, the Johars, all the young militants who had lived in, our, in Europe, these were young. So these young who have turned huh, into the country, they could have joined the new Oromo Democratic Movement and gradually mm -hmm. probably even part of OLF or OLF will join. So Oromia will have at the end maybe two political parties with a very clear vision and deal with all other parts of Ethiopia as partners and discuss with them, look, this is our plan. This is the way we think for ourselves. And this is what we think about Ethiopia. Discuss yourself. Somalis, you go and discuss in your, uh, in your area. Discuss and, 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 and bring a blueprint. Amharas, discuss among yourselves, and so on and so on. This discussion, finally, it will bring a sort of a common understanding. It didn't happen. And that is always in that country, a shortcut to power. It always brings crisis, and it brought crisis now. And now I'm advising the prime minister, it is not too late. Uh, still, still, there is an opportunity of windows if he goes back. Uh, here we have to understand the very, very good one thing. I read thoroughly the work of the Prime Minister called Madame When I read it, I understood that there is a very big gap between me and him on age. The Prime Minister was born in 1976. Therefore, the Prime Minister, he had never had experienced what happened in 1968 with student movement and what kind of the situation and what kind of country. He knows nothing of the Haile Selassie's regime, how it was built, what was the nature of it, and so on and so on. Because it was not his experience. He was not born. He was born in 1976. Second, it is he knows his knowledge because he didn't experience, he might read about it. He didn't have the experience also from 19, from the revolution until the Dirk controlling the power. Mm. When the no experience of the Dirk's Red Terror, the Dirk's nothing, War in nothing, Eritrea, nothing, the Dirk's nothing, War. Nothing. He was a yeah, he was born 1976. That is, the, he was born the day I left Ethiopia. Mm. I was in exile with uh, all this time, the same like his age. He was, uh, I left 1976, he was born 1976. I never calculated in that way, but one day when I was thinking about it, I understood there is a gap. There is a gap that I lived for, for almost 40 something years in exile, and he was born and he became a prime minister. That is possible in history, but mm -hmm. he didn't experience that. So he was 15 when 1991 was a change came. He was an adult, adolescent. Mm -hmm. So I, the majority of his experience is under the TPLF. Under TPLF. Yeah. So for him also, he will have even more broader, maybe he might have a nostalgic for the previous regimes. That is because he, he never saw them and it could be symbolic, huh? like uh, some young people like Bob Marley or whatever it is and so on, or the Michael Jackson or, or Pele in football and so, and so on. I can understand, I have no problem. I have also young children, I mean, uh, with, with that age, but it could have been for this generation, for him and his, younger generation. I mean, for him, 
people, Mustafa Umar, who Johar even is much younger, I'm saying so, that they can have a framework and then the discussion, if it had been very deep, that it intergenerational discussion will be. Uh, for example, uh, Zagay Asfaw, the one who drafted the, 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 the uh, land reform. Uh, now he's also he's an Eritrean. Um, these two, the one who have uh, uh, drafted the reform uh, of the land reform. If Mr. Oh, Zagay, Marit Larashu, the Dirk's Marit, land to yes, the Tila. Yes. Yeah, to I mean, if, if this, this veteran uh, revolutionary man who had uh, the her, uh, 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 the peasant issue is important for him. If he had participated in this, others, and so and so, Marara Gudena is another generation. And ex EPRP, ex Mason. And all, all if they participate. Anyway, this is the history of the country, the figure of the country. Mm. Most of them are veterans, old. I don't think they have an aspiration to be a prime minister in that country and so and so on. But honestly, generally, they can have advice. I'd say we see this is the way we have to, 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 to continue. And the debate could have been very lovely. And the country was all, all diversity. It's a richness. It's not a, a poverty. It could have made a difference in the region. That is what I think. The mm -hmm. And always uh, for cancer. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, past issues and we are running out of time, but we need to continue the conversation. Uh, we, uh, like you said, I agree with you, Ethiopia is a, a country of the young, 70% uh, of its population are under, what, 25 or maybe 30 years old, uh, relatively young population, and uh, you have no experience uh, outside that of uh, the past 28 years, misrule of the TPLF. So uh, the challenges facing the country are humongous, huge, huge problems. Uh, and so the transition must be carefully thought out, like you said, uh, a drawn out uh, discourse, uh, genuine discourse among intellectuals, uh, civil society, and all kinds of uh, groups and uh, representation uh, that the country needs. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that is not uh, what seems to be happening and that is leading to despair. And there's a lot of uh, signs. Uh, we will talk uh, in the next episode about uh, Professor Merara Gudina's paper, his, re his recommendations, the 10 points. They must be discussed. Uh, they are up there. And the media situation also, which is uh, kind of toxic and uh, extremist passions uh, and uh, uh, constantly drumming up hate and uh, so in the next episode we will uh, we will be discussing in depth on the present and what uh, what is happening on the ground and all these uh, these issues that uh, I have mentioned but for now I'll give you uh, two or three minutes to to conclude the discussion and sort of uh, uh, recommend what we need to discuss in the next episode. I will give you, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the primacy of suggesting which way the discussion should head in, in the next episode, because I don't want to be dictating uh, the questions. Well, uh, uh, Comrade Elias, uh, uh, there is a Somali proverb says, for the crazy, his, his brother is not his soldier. The discussion in Ethiopia, it involves not only Ethiopia, it involves the region. It involves all progressive democratic elements, Eritreans, Sudanese, Somalis, Djiboutians, Kenyans. Our, our, this discussion to bring a peaceful region and cooperative region. 
for the last 60, 70, 80 years, we suffered with contradictions created from outside and contradiction which has existed in, in, in the region utilized for external process. Now we have to be able to be very mature that among Ethiopians, we have to have the patience, as I call it, Sabra Ayuk, that we can have a very long... The, the patience of the prophet Job. Yes. Uh, 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 that we can discuss uh, very peacefully and we don't incite our young people because 70% of the population is younger 30 years old. We will be very responsible if we incite them and incite them into a wrong direction. We are equally responsible uh, and ideologically responsible for the hate which is accumulating among them. That is, we have to be very sure. Second, I think our partners, friends in the region, we have to participate. That's why the Horn of Africa television, it be, our objective is that, that it becomes a sort of a vehicle of discussion. Let us open the Pandora box. Uh, we, have, we have you as an Eritrean, there is other French Eritreans, some Sudanese, and so, and so on, Ethiopian, me, maybe we'll include others and other Ethiopians, to have a very open discussion and not to bring certain ideas to the youth, because this youth must be educated, must be brought. Most of them, they went to school. Schooling is not as equal as education. Anybody can go to school and achieve and have a, a certificate at the end. Education is that a general education. Therefore, I hope that me and you and all our comrades together in this form of Africa television, we will try with our modest uh, uh, ability to open the discussion and I appeal to our Oromo brothers also to come here and to have a debate with us, discussion with us, to listen to them, to listen to their grievances, other than Oromo Ethiopians, Amhara, Somalis, all type, Gurages, uh, Adiyas, uh, Walaitas, the South, we never discussed what they want the Sidamas, what they want the Walaitas, why all this problem in the, in the South, what was their elite vision, we could bring, bring them and discuss with them to understand. If we don't know our, our sickness, we cannot cure it. And I hope that in this way, we will continue with you. And thank you very much, Comrade uh, uh, Elias Amara, for giving me all this opportunity and uh, the television for of Africa, Mr. Handa. I thank all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed, uh, Comrade Mohammed. Uh, it's such a pleasure uh, talking in depth, uh, this kind of uh, uh, giving us insight uh, from your broad experience. Uh, this will be a continuing discussion, I promise you. We'll do it once every week. We may be delayed uh, uh, sometimes, but the, the conversation is going to continue. This is a a much needed uh, discussion and like you said I, I agree with you we will invite others from from Somalia from uh, diverse uh, uh, parts of Ethiopia Eritrea Sudan and uh, uh, let us have a, a broader pan horn uh, discussion towards that vision of uh, a stable peaceful and uh, progressive democratic uh, region that uh, that can live fully uh, and achieve its, its uh, great potentials because the region has great potentials, like you said, potentials of resource, potentials of human capacity, ancient history, civilization, crossroads of culture, and what have you. And there is no reason that we should be stuck in this uh, vicious cycle of conflicts and uh, uh, continuing misunderstandings and animosities. Well, that has to end. Uh, we, we, must become masters of our destiny. And so uh, thank you very much. Until uh, uh, next week, uh, stay well and uh, goodbye.